Um, today, I have the good fortune of my friend Jill Heinerth joining us today. <laughs> uh, she's a Canadian cave diver, underwater explorer, writer, photographer, and filmmaker. And she's a veteran of over 30 years of filming, photography, and exploration on projects in submerged caves and all around the world. So very happy to have her join us today. Um, and yeah, so all right. great. Welcome, Jill. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> and hello, <Yeah>. everybody. <laughs> yeah. so Fellow explorers, kind of, homebound explorers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're uh, we're all kind of, uh, you know, we're sitting topside, you know, all the divers uh, all around mm -hmm. the world. So um, yeah. we wanted to reach out to the community and, you know, start broadcasting and just kind of mm -hmm. keep everyone connected um, because, you know, diving is so social. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing, uh, one thing I wanted to chat about is like, you know, what do you, what do you kind of think about, or what do you do when your schedule just changes so dramatically, <laughs> like it does, right? You know, everything yeah, when, to a Everything hall. I do gets canceled. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, like a lot of people out there, I have, I have meticulously cleaned the house. I finished like <laughs> renovating the bathroom. <laughs> I serviced my gear like again. And uh, there you go. You know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I feel like pretty organized in my personal life here. <laughs> and, but I'm, um, you know, dusting off some writing projects that I'm uh, working on and, and putting together new research for pitches for National Geographic and things like that. Um, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, none of us knows how this is going to go other than the fact that I think yeah. it's going to go longer than any of us expect. So I think we need to get used to this uh, new, quote, normal. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it's a new normal. It's crazy times right now. It's, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, we, we have so much uncertainty. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's so important to like, if you can't go outside, you know, at least just exercise mm -hmm. your mind with reading mm -hmm. and you know, and then communicating like we're doing, right? Yeah, I'm really fortunate to live in a very small town in uh, in Canada. So uh, we, we're right on the Trans-Canada Trail and I can sneak mm. out, go for a hike and bike ride and uh, not have to worry about getting too close to people. So so we're not completely like housebound, you know, we, we have some good, flexibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just haven't been going diving. I mean, it's so tempting because I like I've got water outside my back door, but I feel it's important uh, not to be taking risks right now. Um, you know, I could slip off into the water, go do my thing and come back and everything would be fine. And I'd never even have to see another human being and dive solo. But uh, it just doesn't feel right because if something happened, um, mm -hmm. that would burden, you know, the emergency, yep. emergency system and we shouldn't be yeah, doing that that's right now. Point, yeah. yeah, there's a yeah. lot of that I know here locally, yeah. Yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's a tough choice, but I think, you know, the more strict we are with this isolation, the more likely we'll be through this faster if everybody complies. But right. if everybody's out, you know, taking little risks, and then this is going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, like we're not filling up the beaches here in Florida. You know, it's it's spring break yeah. down here, so it's kind of mm -hmm. it's a hard time for everybody to just stay inside. And the parks are struggling to, mm -hmm. people are struggling to not go out to the parks. Yeah. yeah, although when you think about it, I mean, there are people making a lot bigger sacrifices than we are just staying home right now. Like, exactly. At least we have yeah. some great opportunities for learning and, and uh, you know, doing all those things that, that uh, have been on that to-do list for so long. But there's a lot of people that are, you know, still going to work in the trenches, basically facing great yeah. risks. So I don't feel like I'm very hard up compared to that. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, yeah, mm. you, we have to, you know, count our, our blessings with that because, yeah. you know, there are some people mm -hmm. that they're, they're having a hard time right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, right. a little bit uh, on, you know, the lighter side of current events, because I'm sure we're all, you know, watching that real close. The, you yeah. Know, you have such a, an interesting background with uh, some of the projects that you used to work on with the U.S. Deep Caving Team. And mm -hmm. I would love to, like, share with that some of those experiences of working mm -hmm. with Bill Stone and Wakala and using the Cislunar Rebreather. Mm, yeah. Uh, so I had a chance to start really early in rebreathers in the 90s. Uh, and, and a lot of that was with Bill Stone and the in the US Deep Caving team. So in, in 97, 98, we did uh, the Wakulla 2 project where we used mm -hmm. um, uh, Cislunar Mark 5 P's and um, dual 
cislunar um, Mark Fives uh, to do uh, very deep and long missions, um, 22 to 24 hour missions, um, yeah. like 300 feet deep with the rest of that decompression. <laughs> right, so right. like um, five hours of bottom time at 300 feet and the rest decompression. Um, yeah, so that was, you know, really early in, in, in the sort of uh, rebreather pioneering, I guess. That was probably the first big long range um, project with tech rebreather diving. Um, and that was a fantastic experience for me, right from the fact that when we bought the Mark Fives, there wasn't even a, a rebreather class. You know? <laughs> we had to right, yeah, so, on our so own. much has changed yeah. since then, and it really wasn't that yeah. long ago. No, no, yeah, it, it's amazing how uh, how uh, ubiquitous they are, you know, in cave diving and wreck diving now. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. you go out to Ginny Springs here locally in, in Florida, and you know, you're, we're seeing so mm -hmm. many more rebreathers, and mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, eighteen, twenty year olds even on rebreathers now. Yeah, so it, yeah, no kidding, eh? Very impressive, you know. So <laughs> it's yeah. you know. Um, you know, talking about how those rebreathers have evolved, like what are like some differences since like, you know, since, cause that was, the cis lunar was a dual rebreather mm -hmm. in, in a sense, you know. Well, one um, of them was, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, and I just noticed on the, the chat that uh, Stefan said, how did you manage scrubber time back then? So All right. uh, the, the, the truth is that we didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you could answer so, yeah, I, uh, you know, in those early days, we didn't know how long the scrubbers would last. Um, you know, we didn't even have like standard, you know, CE tests, uh, test pilot uh, right there, man. you know, regimens and things. So literally it was, oh, well, let's see how long the scrubber will last, you know, uh, because we also presumed at that time that we would be able to detect um, symptoms of CO2 in time to bail out. Um, so there was a lot of guinea pig testing back then. Right. And, uh, you know, there was also a lot of using scrubbers for like 12 and 14 and 16 hours. <laughs> um, crazy times. And then and then we also also experimented with um, lithium hydroxide as well. Like the, wow. the Cislunar uh, Mark 5P had a hydrophobic membrane um, for the stack. So you could completely flood the rebreather and the stack and, and then... You could remove the the water from the rig and continue diving, um, and so even if you used a volatile scrubber like lithium hydroxide, um, it, it would remain um, watertight. The scrubber remained watertight. So we played with that a little bit because that would offer you twenty four hour plus um, yeah, yeah time. But you know to pack lithium hydroxide is is you know danger to your health. You got to wear a respirator, gloves, everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, is Stefan's asking? Whoa, how many how many pounds were there in the Cislunar scrubber? Five oh, and nice. a half. They should pipe them <laughs> in and join us, right? Yeah, so it was pretty standard, you know, five and a half uh, pound scrubber. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, we were completely blowing scrubbers out of the water, and at the same time that I was using a scrubber for like fourteen hours, John Earl over in Hawaii would break through at six. So that shows you, like, wow, what a difference! Uh, yeah. A difference between between people he's he's no slouch either um mm -hmm. at all you know very fit guy so just shows you how how different we probably are in oxygen metabolism too um yeah so it was nuts <laughs> we used yeah, batteries it, beyond their their extended range as well like we had a set of batteries in that rebreather that cost over 100 bucks and it wow, it was worth yeah. about um, up to 40 hours. And I remember um, Bill saying, hey, you know, see how long you can, you know, take these batteries. We don't really know. Um, you know, just be prepared to, to run on manual on the way out if something goes wrong kind of thing. So bright me, I take... Uh, I take the rebreather to uh, this this 300 foot deep cave through a small restriction, and then the uh, the lithium C cell in the back of my rebreather exploded. Oh no! <laughs> so when you deeply discharge a battery that doesn't have a proper cutoff circuit, which those didn't back then because we didn't know um, deep discharge, and uh, that that C cell exploded out the back of my rebreather. But okay, so it went out of the system. That's good, you know. Well, yeah, fortunately, we knew in the engineering of that unit that we shouldn't have re batteries inside the breathing loop. So 
it uh, it just completely blew this Delirin cap out of this steel brain box of the rebreather, and and it was still fizzing by the time I'd finished all the deco for the dive when I got out of the water. So, <laughs> wow, that's yeah, yeah, that's always fun, right? So I'm experimenting with that, and so the mm-hmm. you know yeah. it's um, yeah, it's like Stefan is saying, what is the same, you know. You say like a hydrofo the the scrubber had a hydrophobic membrane. Um, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. do you see that kind of design still being around in different rebreathers? Nobody has the hydro- hydrophobic membrane that uh, Cislunar had. Um, and in fact, if you try to buy one of those scrubber canisters today, like a lot of people do to re- you can find retrofit, them in the aftermarket. Yeah. yeah, to re- retrofit other rebreathers, they're still about. 2000 to 2200 bucks for the scrubber canister because of that magic membrane mm-hmm. um, that's a propri- proprietary fabric um, from the aerospace industry. Um, yeah, but it's it's kind of cool to, to know that, you know, we could flood those rebreathers and we did in, in training constantly um, in order to um, practice. But yeah, yeah. It- yeah. I mean, you, you got to know where the line is and mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of a, I feel like that's kind of a common thing, at least here in Florida, that people like to know where the line is and that's where they, mm-hmm. they get close to it. And, you know, mm-hmm. thankfully well, thing, now we have more testing and training available. Right. And we can't assume that, it, uh, that anyone will detect the symptoms before, like that's important to stress that you yeah. can't count on the human body to detect CO2, because uh, usually, especially in a in a high workload, um, that uh, those symptoms might be masked just by high workload. So you're already huffing and puffing and breathing and you think it's just because you're working hard. It might be mm-hmm. the CO2. So CO2 sensing um, is, in my opinion, a, a, a real critical next step for all rebreathers, but not the right, infrared yeah. sensing, but solid state CO2 sensing that that won't need to be calibrated and won't have issues in moisture. So, yeah, it's, it's just such yeah. an extreme environment with the mo- the moisture is what I, all these sensors have such a hard time with. And so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had a, a one that was working really well in the Sentinel rebreather that I dove for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but most people complained about the size of the Sentinel. They're like, oh, my God, that thing's so huge. I had this giant, you know, yeah. Thing, the refrigerator, you know, right? right, right, and yeah. Granted, it was huge and it was heavy to travel with, and you know, it presented a big mass underwater to to swim. But um, but the CO two sensor worked because there was quite a large air space, like around the sensors and the head, um, and so wow. where the CO two sensor was inside that very large insulated um, head, it stayed dry, and so it worked very well. But the very same CO2 sensor in another rebreather loop probably wouldn't work as well. Like if if the materials were metal and there's more condensation in there, that CO2 sensor is probably not going to work. Or if there's not all that space to give it a nice dry, hot, you know, area to to work in, it's not going to work as well. So that's why the solid state sensing is really the only the only way forward, in my opinion. How interesting about, you know, mm. the design of these rebreathers. It's, you know, that's mm-hmm. why, you know, with every rebreather, you have to be doing a specific certification and a specific class on it. And so, yeah, and that's why that third party testing is so important as well. I mean, you know, we can look at similar masses of, of sorb in different rebreathers and see a completely different um, canister duration and a completely different roll-off behavior at depth. And, um, mm-hmm. the, you know, the internet is, is the, the worst for disseminating like false information about, you know, about five pounds of sorb is five pounds of sorb. Well, clearly it is not <laughs> when we, uh, when we actually test it. So um, that's why it's really important um, to be working with a manufacturer that that values third party independent testing, you know, like you guys do. So that's, that's yeah, I mean, that's something we try to do. You know, we um, yeah. we really strive for that. And you know, it, it reminds me a lot of your hypoxia video that you did. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've seen mm-hmm. instructors where they try to test to to teach students that how to recognize symptoms, and everyone's so different. You know, you're basically your brain stops recording. You know, yeah. and so you're still active mm-hmm. and engaged, but you're essentially not going to remember anything. And so how can you respond yeah. underwater? 
Yeah, I mean, we determined from those those early hypoxia tests, and maybe I should just describe that for people that haven't seen my YouTube yeah, video you. on that. But um, so back in the '90s, again, we had no rebreather courses. We knew nothing about how to how to use these, let alone teach them. And we were trying to mm-hmm. figure out what was the best way to teach, you know, critical skills and what we should teach. And we wanted to know what it felt like to get hypoxia in a safe um, environment. Uh, yeah. So we set up a classroom test. As controlled as possible, yeah. <laughs> Which wasn't safe. <laughs> we set up a classroom situation where the person on the rebreather would not see their display, so they wouldn't know what their PO2 was. They would know that we were going to cut off their oxygen, so their PO2 mm-hmm. would be slowly dropping. We had a video camera running, and then the instruction to the individual was, um, write down any symptoms that you feel that might indicate hypoxia. But as soon as you think that something's wrong, bail out to open circuit. And with yeah. the with the cislunar, you know, it's already in your mouth. All you have to do is turn the switch. Just, yeah, BOV, yeah, bailout valve. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what we what we discovered is that is that people would write down a symptom. Now think about that. If they're already writing down tingling, that means they know something's wrong and they should be bailing out. But they didn't. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So we we intentionally gave these like these conflicting um, instructions to to see what would happen. So yeah, mm-hmm. he's writing down tingling, and then he he's sort of looking puzzled, and and I'm watching the PO2 drop and drop and drop and drop. It and dropped so low, and it took so long. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh no. Okay. Hey, welcome back. Looks like we lost uh, the feed. Because in our con, we didn't notice because our the conversation's been getting really good. So yeah, we've been um, having a great time. Sorry, we yeah. weren't like sharing it with anybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I so I think last we were talking, we we're uh, oh with the with pool training. So like you know crash mm-hmm. test training. Mm-hmm. You know um, how so how did how would you test for CO two? Like how would you guys experiment where yeah. where the line is for <laughs> CO two? So for the CO2 testing in those early days, we uh, put people in the pool without a scrubber and told them to put their head against the end of the swimming pool. And we had an, inst- <laughs> an instructor on either side holding on to the mm-hmm. person. And then they were told to swim as hard as they could. And when they felt like they were having an issue, bail out. So um, 90% of the people never bailed out. Uh, wow. But that's, after that's the crazy. exercise... Yeah. Yeah, after the exercise, they reported that they felt tingling in their face, they felt twitching, they felt um, difficulty breathing. And most of the time, we actually stopped the drill because we'd see their legs go weird or they'd kind of slump <laughs> in the pool. And we'd pull them up kind of semi-conscious, put them on O2, and then send them home with a headache. Um, and we did this with a lot of military guys because that's where a lot of those rebreathers ended up. In, in the early days. Um, so when we were trailing, training military guys, we were allowed to do lots, lots of stuff like that. Oh, um, wow. And people would only last 45 seconds working hard, you know, um, and the longest was like a minute and 15. Now, I do recognize that probably some of that is like competitiveness amongst these military guys. Oh, like, they're just like know, holding I made on. a minute, you know. Yeah, but, but most of them did report that they felt symptoms and and didn't do anything about it. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. But don't don't try this at home. Don't try this with your yeah, students. Yeah, <laughs> don't try this at home. Yeah, you know, now there's courses on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But basically, what the bottom line is is that from those experiences, and then also from recent Dan um, quantitative studies, they've determined that if you're under a reasonable workload underwater, you are unlikely to feel a symptom of carbon dioxide or Mm -hmm. hypoxia, hyperoxia, any of those, um, you're unlikely to be able to detect it just based on your own symptoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that's incredible. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, one of the, I believe that such an important tool is a bio is a bailout valve, um, you know, having that mouthpiece, but it, like you're saying at the same time, like you, when you think that you need to bail out, you know, it's probably too late. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you some food for thought on bailout yeah. valves. Um, so, if you're a recreational rebreather diver and, mm-hmm. um, you know, off on an Odeco, uh easy dive, uh, then, you know, a bailout valve, great. Immediately switch to a breathable um, gas. Mm-hmm. 
The thing with bailout valves as you start to get a little bit more complicated is the bailout valve has to be plumbed to a meaningful amount. Right. And source of the right gas at the right time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, which means in most cases, you must um, add additional plumbing to offboard yeah, bailout off tanks, yeah. right? Because that onboard mm -hmm. tank isn't going to be get done you anything more than straight to the surface, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, rather than a bailout valve, too, you can also, on most rebreathers, open loop breathe, right? So, an injection of diluent, psh, inhale. Mm -hmm. exhale bubbles psh, inhale psh, exhale bubbles you don't even have to have the bov for that right yeah it's really easy on a on a liberty with those little switches right up there right yeah with those masks yeah they're <laughs> yeah, real handy yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um so once you get into the more technical deeper stuff right it's got to be plumbed to the right gas in the right amount which means extra plumbing has that extra plumbing created extra plumbing issues like extra failure points is if if the BOV like a lot of people are putting um, third party BOVs onto a rebreather and those third party BOVs may not be independently tested and verified and the the space inside the BOV could be um, too large and and therefore uh, be uh, contributing to carbon dioxide buildup in that dead space. So interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who think they're using great BOVs, right? But then they, you know. They still have an issue, um, maybe even the precipitated by the BOV itself. Um, so my opinion really is is I kind of like doing the same thing all the time in the same way in terms of my emergency procedures. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd rather switch to an open circuit regulator on a bailout tank. Now, I recognize that... Um, you know, I've, I've brought somebody out of a cave uh, with a serious CO2 hit, and I know how hard it is to convince someone to get that mouthpiece out of their mouth and put another one in. Right. Um, a lot of regulator rejection is actually pretty, it'll happen in a panic even, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't control it when you're having a mm -hmm. CO2 hit. But, but that's going to happen probably regardless of that. BOV, right? Like, unless you're constantly, you know, switching, right? <laughs> switching As you're tanks, coming up, you're right? plumbing to what gas you should bail like, out to. You. Do all of your tanks have that same plumbing capability? Does your buddy's tanks have the same plumbing hookup to hook into yours? Like, the day that I brought the guy out of the cave from just a thousand feet in, he went through um, four, four gas switches then they were they were really really tough to get him to switch from one mouthpiece to the next but we simply depleted all of his gas and went on to mine so yeah um so stefan's saying bov just for sanity breath no there's no such thing as a sanity breath in right my opinion. i i kind of agree with that as well because because you can have you know you can take a breath and go oh yeah everything's fine great and then <laughs> right? in fact i think there's probably enough evidence to show that that's happened quite a bit so um a sanity breath might make you instantly feel better but then you've got to stay on the open circuit so off the, yeah once you get off the loop you have to stay off you know well it might be several minutes before you change you know your body's uh, situation you know you might have just cleared one breath but you've got to change your your body's situation so um so sanity breath no especially with co2 and the you know the the affinity co2 has to hemoglobin you know just to get it out of your system, it takes a long time to completely get it out of your system. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. CO2 hits like the real ones that I've seen can be hours before the person's breathing normally again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um, it looks like Adam asked about is there any data about cognitive abilities of hypoxic divers? Uh, that's interesting. I don't know if there's been any. Uh, studies on that um i'm sure the cognitive cognitive abilities are horrific <laughs> yeah, right yeah. yeah i mean you might think you know what's going on but actually being able to take action is unlikely. you're actually not recording yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's um you know it's um it's it's so interesting the early days of kind of like when you know civilians were using rebreathers and just like they were kind of being applied in more um I don't want to say sport divers, but, you know, mm -hmm. people were buying them and using them and taking them out. And so there was a, a huge learning curve 
And mm-hmm. so now there's so much training, there's so much different experience. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, but, but, but don't forget, we're still, we're still at the guinea pig phase of, of rebreather diving, really. I mean, um, you know, when I started back in the 90s, things broke all the time. We expected things to break all the time. We got a lot yeah, of experience yeah. because, because stuff never worked. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and we had to deal with a lot of emergencies. You learn how to fix it, right? Yeah, and I carried that that fear of rebreathers with me through my whole career. But, you know, today someone's likely to buy a rebreather. It works really well. They don't have anything that scares the crap out of them for a couple hundred hours. Um, and so it's important to guard against complacency. But but the bottom line still is there's not that many rebreathers in the overall global marketplace. And um, so we're yeah, learning. It's still 1% of 1% of an industry. So Right, right. So mm-hmm. we're still learning. We have to keep open minds about uh, about new information and new studies that are done and, and keep revising um, to, to have the best possible safe practices. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um yeah, I think I have like a, a, a like a question on kind mm-hmm. of that thought, but um, you know, it's like a lot of time when we talk, like in the industry, we always talk about how things have changed. Like with rebreathers, what are some th- what are some things that you think with technical diving that has just like it's like it's fundamental. It's not going to change, you know. Oh, that isn't going to change. Have not changed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oof. Well, that's interesting. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot that's 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 really uh, similar to, to to when I when I started. Although, it, I would say one of the things that maybe has has changed is it's become it's become easier now. Like easier to go drop your credit card, get training. Like it used to be really really hard. First of all, there were no classes for anything, so we were self taught. Mm-hmm. Um, and had to rely on a lot of experience building to to learn things. But but then when the first instructors kind of you know appeared in different in different areas, it was really hard to get um, good instruction from someone, and really hard to get the equipment. And in many cases, yeah. you had to make stuff. Um, so you had to we, really earn it. Yeah. Well, we spent a lot more time dive planning. We didn't have computers. Everything was done manually. So you're always working out spreadsheets for. For your plan, if you're staying on the loop, your plan, if you're bailing to open circuit, your plan for five minutes more, five minutes less, 10 feet deeper, 10 feet less, like yeah. all all those run tables, we, we would you'd spend a whole day just making run tables and strapping them on your wrist. And, right. Yeah. And those, those wrist yeah. lights, they used to have different pages and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I sort of feel like, like back then, um, there, there was more of a culture of safety um, I, I get a little bit worried where diving has become easy enough. Tech diving has become easy enough that that some of that culture of safety is just gone. Um, hmm. You know, I, I I cringe, but I still see people all the time who prepare their rebreather without a checklist. And like, I've been diving rebreathers longer than almost anybody, and I still use a checklist every time. Yeah. Um, people yeah. say to me, "Well, if you can't remember the checklist, then you shouldn't be diving the rebreather." And I'm like. No, <laughs> you wouldn't get on a plane with a with a pilot that said that, would you? I mean, and, yeah. and what could possibly be wrong with spending a few extra minutes with an actual electronic or printed checklist and checking the boxes to make sure you didn't get distracted and miss something? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that, it's exactly it. You see pilots and everyone that they're, they're using checklists in, to take the human nature out. Mm-hmm. And so um, to, yeah, make sure that we don't forget things. Yeah. I mean, we don't find dead guys with checklists that are completed, <laughs> basically. I mean. The common denominator, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Andrew Fox study on uh, rebreather fatalities a few years ago uh, was a really interesting one. That was precipitated by uh, a comment that I'd made on a National Geographic program. And he's like, surely that can't be true. And he wanted to to quantify um, uh who was dying on rebreathers basically and 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 in a nutshell the the results of his study were that there's no brand um or type of rebreather like electronic versus manual or Mm -hmm. this brand versus that brand that's that's 
physically causing more fatalities than another rebreather, that it's actually the human behaviors that are causing the incidences and fatalities, and, and that 90% of the incidents and the fatalities that he examined, which was quite a pretty a, a large data set. Yeah, those could have those accidents would have been prevented by actions taken by the diver before the dive began. So mm -hmm. either doing the checklist or remembering to you know turn on their oxygen, <laughs> something crazy like like yeah. that, that that was omitted. Yeah, and then you know obviously a significant number of other ones are are physically you know health issues as well. So yeah. And you know, one a big factor of that is that when you see a lot of the fatalities, it's it's just considered drowning or something mm -hmm. like that, rather than yeah. Yeah. Know. What's important is the root cause. Obviously, when yeah. people die underwater, they drown, right? So yeah, yeah. that's what yeah. the coroner says. But the root cause of why they drown is important. Um, actually, I see that deviant. I see that Becky uh, Becky yeah. Kagan put a great comment here. You know, how do you stress that experience can only come with time, especially with people going so fast now? And and I guess that's that's really where I was trying to go on that comment, where it, it's become so easy just to drop a credit card and get training and equipment, and very quickly, you know, you're running to the back of the cave to places that were world records ten years ago. Um, experience is so critically important because rebreathers are so reliable today. It's a long time before you have something that scares the crap out of you mm -hmm. and resets your behavior back to that, you know, driving like with your hands on the wheel <laughs> kind of Right. Thing. Yeah. It kicks you um, back. Yeah. 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 I mean, when we learn any new skill, the reason why we take a class is because we are unaware of the risk, right? And we're incompetent with the skills. So we sign up for a class with an expert that can guide us through that experience. They can make us aware of all the risks. They can make us aware of, you know, hypoxia, hyperoxia, you know, hypercarbia, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we can learn to shave on their beard, right? learn about all the anecdotes and things that have happened yeah. to them. So when we graduate from a class, whether it's a rebreather class or learning to drive a car, you're then conscious of the risks and competent with the skill set that we've determined are the standards, you know. So um, you leave a class, you might be the safest rebreather diver you're ever going to be at that moment because right, you understand exactly, yeah, the risk. Yeah. You recognize risk and um, and you're good with all those skills and drills because you mastered them in class. What happens next is the problem, right? You go and dive, dive, dive. You go to Ginny like a hundred times. Nothing mm -hmm. ever goes wrong. And before you know it, you're not consciously monitoring the displays as often. Like you're driving you're back like, to work, you know, and you don't see exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you drive all the way to work and you don't even remember anything you've seen unless some purple cow jumped in front of your car. Um, so so if nothing happens incident-wise, that's when complacency creeps in. And it also, you know, we have another thing that happens like at a time like this when we're at all at home and not on our rebreathers, we're also going to get incompetent in the skills again. So we yeah. still recognize risk, but but we're going to get rusty and we're going to need to get back into the pool and get back into our drills and skills so that we're competent and conscious again and force ourselves into driving that rebreather in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, uh, and, and I also, I see a lot of chatter online about people saying like, oh, well, that's obvious. Those things are so obvious. And, but when you go to the dive sites, everyone's mm -hmm. playing, everyone's having a great time and, yeah. you know, and, but people are skipping steps, people are doing things. And so it's mm -hmm. like Stefan says, that normalization of deviance, it's like, yeah. it's a shifting baseline of your complacency. Yeah. 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 I mean, if, if, if these are so obvious, then why are good people still making bad mistakes and getting themselves killed? Um, mm -hmm. So I think if you've been diving long enough, you probably have a friend that um, has died technical mm -hmm. diving. And we always go to these incident reports and we always, you know, look at them and go, I would never do that. Well, maybe you would. Right? I'd say look a little bit deeper and say, well, why did this good person do that? What were the steps that led them down that, that complacency trap and allowed them to get in the water with two or three out of three sensors or with this little leak only or. Yeah, um, this was so, mm -hmm. this, is, oh, this leak's mm -hmm. always been going on. Nothing happened mm -hmm. last time. It's okay this time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, let's see what Be- Becky's chiming in. We got a piper in. Oh, Becky's so. got a long one. Okay. She says, yeah. can you explain what you feel a proper workup dive is? I've seen lately that my idea of a workup dive for, say, the Great Lakes might be different than what someone else thinks is a workup dive jumping off in the quarry at 100 feet all at once. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, when I've had a like a either time like this when I haven't been in the water for a couple of weeks, couple of weeks like i'm not saying months right <laughs> like, i want everyone to understand way, exactly, here yeah. i want everyone to understand here you know that that this isn't like an action i take after like six month absence from the water a couple of weeks out of the water is enough to get rusty yeah, right yeah so y- you don't just jump in and drop down in the quarry to 100 feet right like mm-hmm. first you know i i go through everything on my bench and i you know do my my whole pre-dive, my checklist, and I and I actually review my skills and drills. I mean, the ones that I, you know, would teach someone for a first rebreather experience. Um, and then I I have a river out here that's like pool depth, and so I use I use the pool to get myself back into it. Um, but but workup dives are progressive, right? So it depends on on what you want to do. But it's really important to slowly get back into that. It, I could list a number of friends that decided that their workup dive was like, you know, jumping back full on and uh, and uh, and then having an accident that either injured or killed them. I mean, there's there's great people out there that we've lost because they thought their workup dive should be just done on the charter. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. It just takes once. I mean, I'm the same way with I'm out of the water two weeks and I'm just like, oh, man, I'm getting rusty. And, mm-hmm. yeah. you know it's people will think maybe months but like and granted mm-hmm. like you know it's it's a living for me and yeah. so but still you know a mm-hmm. pool session is you know mm-hmm. so important mm-hmm. so important i see a really cool question here from adam do you think that mm-hmm. a randomized situation generator could be used to mitigate the complacency yeah i think that's a really cool concept um when uh in some of the earlier um uh, cislunar rebreathers they actually had um problems that it could shoot at you simulator problems um and they had some really funny responses for oh, them too. Like, have yeah. you checked your insurance lately because you really <laughs> uh, no i have um, <laughs> but um but when we did the wakala dives that we were talking about at the beginning of this broadcast um we spent an entire month swimming laps around the open water at wakala springs now if any of you have been to Wakulla Springs, you can know what torture that is when you know that one of the most beautiful caves in the world is, is just a few feet away. But for one whole month, we swam laps around the basin. So when I proposed to the dive safety control board on that project that I wanted to do a five-hour bottom time at 300 feet with Mark Meadows, what we had to do was five hours of swimming laps with the scooters in the open water while safety divers swam up to us with cue cards going uh you know sensor twos down or Mm -hmm. your scooter's broken or this or that or they just kept heaping on problems and we would have to respond to the problem reverse our position like like reverse our direction as if we were bailing out of the cave oh nice swim like that whole five hours you know so we we would know not only that we were capable of dealing with all the skills and drills but also we were capable with dealing with the exhaustion that would come with swimming for five hours yeah so yeah, like, yeah, I think that's interesting. I've often wondered whether like something like that or even, you know, some kind of tactile feedback that would just kind of, you know, vibrate or or buzz every 5 minutes just to remind you, you know, to have you checked your sensor or so have you checked your displays or whatever? I don't know. Like there has to be yeah. some way that we could just wake people up every every few minutes. <laughs> it's like a yeah, like a, a notification on a phone. You know, but mm-hmm. you have that in the software, the compu- the dive computer and the mm-hmm. rebreather, you know, so. Yeah, but hopefully in a way that um, wouldn't either create the sort of boy who cried wolf scenario or, or just. Uh, that's a good to, point. Yeah, get you get so many alarms or notifications, you just ignore them. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, the, you know, those, those experiences are pretty unique mm-hmm. of swimming in the basin like swimming in the mm-hmm. basin all color for five hours i mean it's like yeah you know it's uh in such unique training uh yeah. on that in scenarios that you can create for that i mean mm-hmm. like we used to teach when i used to teach at the university i had open water students for an entire semester mm-hmm. and it's a semester yeah. where we could just 
build on skills and just take our times. And then even the dive mm-hmm. masters, I could give, I could throw them such unique scenarios and like working with different variety of students, same with like the rescue classes, we could get real theatrical. Mm-hmm. And so cause we had so much time. And so it's, you know, it's, it's important to see, like, if you want to be serious or make a career in diving is mm-hmm. to think what, how can I build the most experience? How can I have the most different kind of experiences? It's not like, oh, I've been diving for 20 years. It's what kind of diving have you been doing mm-hmm. in that time? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there's certain things that I, like, I don't even teach anymore um, because it's not the kind of diving that I'm doing anymore. So, uh, yeah, it, it currency is not just about being in the water but it's being in the water and the appropriate ex- like experiences that work you up for mm-hmm. a trip or a project or a goal or whatever else so yeah like I, the years ago i remember going to to finland i was going to dive in oyamo mine and i was borrowing a, a rebreather um, so i didn't have to fly with one so i was borrowing it from one of my former students and uh, he was going to bring me a, a meg uh, to the site and uh when I got there, he goes, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, but the, the rebreather didn't pass the checks. So I went and I filled open circuit tanks for you. And, and uh, yeah. you know, we'll go off on this dive in the mine. Um, and it, it's a deep mix dive on scooters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I looked at him and I'm like, I haven't dived like open circuit trimix in like 15 years, right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh no, my it's God. A completely different kind of dive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, oh, I'm totally like, yeah. I had yeah. the same experience last week. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we're doing some DPV work and we're like, okay, well, we're going to do everything side mount open circuit. And I was like, wow, mm-hmm. haven't, haven't done open circuit in, you know, in a, while. a couple of years. And then like in mm-hmm. cave diving with it, you know, how's my gas consumption, you know? Yeah. Everything's completely different. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. Actually, the, the funny end to that story was that um, these tanks that he brought me were huge. I mean, I, I had not even seen tanks like this in North America. And I'm like, oh my God. Bank bottles. Yeah. So he says, and, and, you know, two stages, everything else. And he's like, so, um, do you want some lead? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh my God. Those look <laughs> I need like, an airbag. Yeah. yeah, those look enormous. And when I first got in the water, sure enough, I was like, whoa, I'm really negative. This wing is like Oh my God. <laughs> maybe not Struggling. enough for this. You know, but we go off and we do the dive and have a great time. We go out to this cool area called Hell's Gate. And and on the way back, we're going zipping through this little passage called Super Mario Land that's twisty turny up and down. And love the name. And yeah. I, started feeling light and i'm like what how could this be you these tanks are huge i'm starting to feel buoyant and every time i'd ease off the trigger a little bit i'm like Ooh, I'm oh no it's you knew it was coming yeah so, oh crap so by the time we get out of the cave into the lake which has a frozen surface because it's like february in finland um oh, so we're doing deco and under a frozen ceiling uh, I'm, I'm like quite light. And so I'm really raisining my dry suit and I'm hanging on to the, the log on, uh, on Deco thinking I must look like a complete idiot, the complete <laughs> neophyte, right? <laughs> like, freezing because I've let all the air out of my suit yeah, to stay down. Yeah. And then, uh, I got out at the end of the, at the end of the dive and they're all laughing and they're like, Oh, you, you people from, from America, you never want to take lead with these tanks. You know, you, JJ did the same thing when he was here. <laughs> like, okay. Well, it's cause we don't yeah, have these me. tanks. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't think it was going to change. They're still tanks. Yeah. 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 That's funny. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, those are the experiences. That's where the local experience really comes in on some of those stuff. Like, you know, oh, yeah. throwing on with different bottles and it's, it's so funny. You can be so particular. And then when one little thing changes, it throws everything off. Yeah. It doesn't matter how long you've been diving. Like uh, there'll always be new experiences, new failures, and then you'll always see new things that happen to your friends or students or whatever else. Like, uh, it, yeah, constantly. It's like, Oh, never seen that before. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a new one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, let me see. You know, um, it's interesting how you were saying how you like safety culture has changed um, Mm -hmm. or it's different because 
I, and it's maybe because it comes from my background. You know, NASA is so safety. It's become mm -hmm. so safety culture. It's in the mantra. Mm -hmm. You start safe, stay safe. It's yeah. so aware of it. And, you know, now I, I found that I like we made fun of it when I was younger, but now I'm like, no, that's start safe, stay safe. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. You know, I um, mean, all of these procedures might take you like a couple of extra minutes to prepare for and conduct your dive responsibly. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So is your life not worth that? I mean, be aware that like if your rebreather is not, not third party tested, um, mm -hmm. then uh, it's, you know, we demand more testing and excellence out of our toasters <laughs> than we do about our, out of our life support equipment in North America. Right, yeah. You know, in Europe, it's different. You must have the CE mark in Europe. But, but you know, I, I kind of feel the same way that people sort of look at safety in that way, too. They're like, oh, you know, too casual, too casual about it. it you know, yeah, it's, it's where in, I mean, like... You, you, I mean, you know how, you know, the Florida has a reputation of being a lot of cowboys. And I, mm -hmm. I always, I, th I kind of thought like, you know, cowboy diving, it's, it's, it doesn't seem as relevant. I thought it didn't seem as relevant anymore, but you know, that's just mm -hmm. probably my shift, my shifting in my perspective on it. And yeah. You know, and it may be the people that, that you surround yourself with as well. Right. Um, yeah. That are, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's incumbent in all of us really to to continue to push it and call it out when we when we see th things that are issues. I mean, because the bottom line is when you take a risk like not properly, you know, preparing your rebreather with a checklist, when you take a risk, it's not your risk, right? It, your risk it's is so going you to impact other people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Family, friends, community, the site might get closed. Somebody may have to recover your body. Um, you and your dive take buddy. Great yeah. risk to do that. Mm -hmm. Um you know, yeah, there's a lot of other people involved in that risk scenario. Do you think that, so Adam has another question. He's mm -hmm. been doing a good job. Do you think that there should be a troubleshooting database for divers? Maybe mm -hmm. we could bring in some fancy statistics and find optimal solutions to more common problems divers could face underwater. That's yeah. an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, a lot of, there have been some attempts at this in the past and also accident and incident reporting. Mm -hmm efforts um it's really hard to get people to report what goes wrong it's really hard to get people to share the stories of the mistakes that they've made in their in their life and career it'd be great if everybody did that a lot more openly i mean but yeah i i think that would be very useful um social media behavior is not pretty and so oftentimes as soon as someone shares something, they get attacked and it's like ah, what yeah. a shame we could all learn from people's experiences for sure and it's it's so much uh, so much uh, in diving is based off of reputation, um, mm -hmm. and so if you see if if I'm an instructor and I have an accident and I report mm -hmm. it and everyone's like, well, look at Joe, he, how mm -hmm. good of an instructor can he be when he's you know having problems like this, like mm -hmm. he didn't go too clean this properly and had a fire mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. you know, even at so at NASA it was interesting we had the we had clean rooms for mm -hmm. all our equipment. And the, cause we were using f about 50% oxygen, 50% nitrox. We actually had a fire inside one of the manifolds mm. and you know, how, you know, it, we had such resources to make sure with such quality control and we still had incidences. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens. So it happens. Yeah. It, well, you know, um, what's interesting, like uh, Santee Diving, they have an interesting philosophy in their company where um, if somebody makes a mistake making a dry suit, they don't get punished when they get found out. Um, when somebody reports a problem, identifies that there's an issue or finds a fault, and they actually get rewarded. Um, and so, so they've shifted the whole philosophy of, re of reporting to make it a positive thing because it allows the entire company to do better and that's good for everybody so well, that's great maybe if we great had culture. an incident yeah maybe if we had an incident database where um maybe you guys or or you could challenge other manufacturers to participate too uh rewarded people in some way for sharing their their story and if there was some kind of a that's you know an point, anonymous man. way to do it it'd be great but yeah, share your story. We'll send you some line arrows or whatever. There you go. You know? yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. we've had some cases uh, where I think somebody bought a a, uh, a Freedom computer that was stolen, 
Mm -hmm. or, or it was just missing and he returned it to us. And so we sent him a new freedom computer because that was, we thought that was so great, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, dive mm -hmm. does strive to do that. And, but that's a great idea to like kind of encourage, uh, a good culture of communication of talking mm -hmm. about these sort of things, because when you're talking to instructors or divers in the industry on a one-on-one -on -one basis, everyone's like, yeah, we should do that. But then mm -hmm. when you have everybody clumped up online, it's a completely different, um, it's a different discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, hey, I see a good question or a good comment here from Dominic yeah. um, uh, from Canada. Uh, oxygen blending is too often done without proper training. I know it happened to me. I thought I was well trained. Now, I wish I knew, <laughs> knew Dominic's story. I wish he was. Oh, uh, I, I think you're going to be talking to Dominic, though, aren't you, on this series? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, we'll have Stefan joining us. Well, I'm hoping okay. we'll get Dominic. Yeah. We're going to be up in his neck of the woods, um, yeah. which is your neck of the woods, too. My neck of the um, woods, yeah. And, and, yeah, do a live stream from a shop or something, yeah. Oh, yeah. When were you guys planning on coming up? Uh, I think July. June. June, yeah. 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 I was supposed to be in uh, either the Philippines or Australia then. That doesn't look like it's happening, though, so. Well, maybe, yeah, come dive over this, right? <laughs> well, yeah, if if <laughs> if life has resumed, resumed to normal, if, if, oh, yeah. if it has, I'll be there because that's just down the road from me. But, yeah. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, was, I have it on video too, Big Bang. Oh, my God. It's, it's, ter it's terrifying, uh, you know, when these types of incidents happen. And mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's so dangerous. And, you know, I know with different, in the at the neutral buoyancy lab we had a blast room mm -hmm. design where we would cart all the cylinders in and mm -hmm. we would hook them up and they had each of them had tethers and it would probably be like a cart of like 10 sets of doubles mm -hmm. and we had a blast chamber that the door was bigger than it was about 10 feet by 10 feet square yeah. room and, you know, and that's because it's government resources. But yeah, that's uh, that's the OSHA guidelines that we're all supposed to be right. following. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm scared of batteries, too. I mean, I, I, had, yeah. I had more than one battery fire in Florida because I'm always on the testing end of, of two battery technologies. It's tough, right. Ooh, man. Yeah. It's scary. And yeah, it's, it's getting more. I mean. Battery, yeah, battery technology. That's I. I'm such a rookie in battery, in like learning about batteries. But it's mm -hmm. it's a it's another technology that's just blowing up, literally. <laughs> literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, in the next few years, we'll have some new, less volatile options available. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. um, you know um. Oh, Maddie put a, a comment here about it. it's like having DCS uh, also stigmatized. Um, and I saw earlier in the in the scroll that somebody asked whether I'd been bent. And, and yeah, I've been bent. And um, uh, yeah, I think that, that that still we stigmatize people for, for getting bent. In my opinion, it's a it's a sports injury. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. In fact, I wrote a, uh, a cover feature for Diver Magazine that's in the current issue of Diver Magazine, and um, you can download that whole issue for free, and it's about, it's about my story of DCS, and, and, um, and then also about you know, stigma and reporting, and then uh, in the next issue, there'll be a, a second long installment. I, I spent a whole year interviewing people about, about their hits and um, trying to get a sense for DCS and the tech diving industry, the stuff that falls between the cracks and doesn't end up in um, right. Dan accident statistics, you know, yeah, and reported. And everyone's mm -hmm. so different. You have, you know, you have these people that they, or you have divers that they do the most wild things and they never have an in incident. And then they're mm -hmm. diving with someone and the person that's with them has an mm -hmm. incident. And sure. It, it's or, yeah. Stigmatized. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I can do the same dive one dive one day and, and another day and have a completely different, you know, bubble load. Like I participated in some of the uh, research with, with Dan researchers with Neil Pollock. Um, he came along mm. on one of my projects and, and we would have like zero bubbles on one day. And then a couple days later, exactly the same dive and be just showering um, wow. you know, a high bubble score. So yeah, interesting stuff. We forget it's a theory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, cool. It's, um, you know, I've been yeah fortunate to never have any incidences and stuff. And 
Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's like, you know, it's a lot of the mantra where you have folks talking about like, at least in technical diving that you should be capable of self rescue. Mm -hmm. And so they think that that justifies diving by yourself exclusively. Now, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I always try to dive with a partner and, you know, but sure there's like times where, you know, this situation calls for a different approach, but it's, um, a, another brain is so, is very helpful. Even mm-hmm. I know, I think yeah. you said one time, a long time ago that, um, when you were on a remote project and you had, there was some, you guys had kind of agreed on this, that if one of the, one of the team members decides that the other team member mm-hmm. is having a problem, that mm-hmm. it's the diver's responsibility to just listen to it because like you mm-hmm. may not be able to assess properly. Um, yeah, I, th- I think on, you know, on expeditions and, and, uh, yeah. we need to have, uh, you know, risk assessment meetings or a dive control safety board, um, to, to help us conduct things. And, and it has to be, you know, un- unanimous, a risk for one is a risk for all, especially in a remote mm-hmm. situation. I mean, you've got to deal with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, that, that kind of brings me to. You, you know, I've been. I maybe I'm probably paying attention to it more, but the, it's. It seems like you have so much more expedition style travel happening now. It's almost like how ecotourism was a couple of years ago, and so oh, yeah. it, it's like, um, you know, some some of these trips, like um, Aaron's trips with the Dirty mm-hmm. Dozen. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. you guys are going pretty far remote, you know. Yeah. And on a liveaboard. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh man, I I was so fortunate to um, have a trip with with Aaron and the Dirty Dozen in January um, to truck, and I think we were the last people in to truck because um, the day after we arrived in truck, they closed um, entry to any country that was affected by coronavirus, and wow. So after that, there were dozens of divers stuck in Guam, never able to get to truck, and um, when we left. Um, I th- I don't think there was another any more groups after after us. Out. I was actually worried about getting home, um, even though it was sort of before the shit really hit the fan in North mm-hmm. America. Um, I saw the writing on the wall. Yeah, yeah, the foresight is so important. Hey, but I mean, other than that, how was the trip like? Oh, amazing, amazing. Um, you know, if this world straightens itself out, I'm going back <laughs> again right? yeah, yeah. Uh, in uh, two years. Um, just being able to be on a, a really comfortable live aboard with a small group of people with the same skill set and get right on top of the rack and just roll off and do your thing. It's like, oh, my God, it was amazing. And yep. those wrecks are incredible. I, you know, you could dive there a lifetime and. And never that's see it scary. all. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's amazing. That's something that I've definitely been trying to find my way out there someday. So yeah. Oh my gosh, it's it's great. Yeah. yeah. It, um, you know, it's uh, I like I noticed that when we would have big projects with NOAA or Parks and Wildlife, you know, you do have a designated safety officer. You have a. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a basically a, a board where everyone's going in and recording all these different components mm-hmm. of each of their dives. Like, did you do this checklist? Did you do this? Mm-hmm. And, yep. you know, with, do you think that that's something that needs to kind of bleed into, I mean, it, it needs yeah. to bleed into like, yeah. you know, travel and whatnot, but do they mm-hmm. have the resources to do it? Absolutely. You know? I mean, when I go on a, a project or pitch a project for TV or for science or whatever, I usually have to write some sort of a SOP, standard operational practice manual. So it's very mm-hmm. clear to the insurance companies, <laughs> the mm-hmm. commissioner, as well as the participants, what's expected for safety every day and how the dive safety after, officer can conduct their activities. But um, like one of the things that, that Aaron did on uh, on Truckmaster Live Aboard uh, was that uh, right before you jumped in the water, so first of all, there was a, definitely the social pressure amongst the group that was, you know, oh, yeah. everybody mm-hmm. does their checklist properly, yada, mm-hmm. yada, yada. But right when you're about to jump in the water, when you walk to the back of the swim platform, somebody's physically there blocking your way with a little laminated sheet, and they're basically giving you your last-minute checks. 
mm-hmm. tricks that you might have been accustomed to doing on your own in your head or whatever, but they're basically saying, is your oxygen on? And you say, mm-hmm. yes, show me, you know, so show me where your injector is, that it's working, the valve's on. And, and he just works through this quick little list that takes 30 seconds, you know, you have the right gas selected, Do you have a safe PO2 in the loop, like the little things that, that, that you could have forgotten, right? Um, and nobody's exempt. So, mm-hmm. you know, the trip leader's not exempt. The dive master's great, not exempt. The boat yeah. owner's not exempt. And I watched him through the week. I think there were two or three small issues that were caught um, in that. Good. It's working, that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and they were by, uh, they like one of the people, you know, caught with a, a small issue was the boat captain, right? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And he's like, oh my God, thank you. Right? Like, whoops, yeah. Um, yeah, and if, if everybody's not... Um, uh, being stupid <laughs> about you know reactions to this kind of stuff, then it can be positive. You know, it's like right, oh, yeah. wow, how awesome that you caught this small issue in this very experienced diver that could have been an accident or an incident. You know, it might have been nothing, but um, but it could have been a problem. And so I think that that's a fantastic way to push that culture of safety. Yeah, that's a that that is a really great way, and that's. Yeah, yeah. It's, that, oh, that see, jump check. yeah. Let's see. Uh, there's so many questions going by. Here's one from Rebecca. Mm-hmm. How do you answer when your loop is in your mouth? It's hard to talk on land when it's in, at least for me. Uh, so when I'm on the swim platform walking to the back of the deck, I never have my loop in my mouth. So I mm-hmm. do those last minute checks without the loop in my mouth. And then I put the loop in my mouth because only then is it is it safe. Um, I, I actually have this thing against people standing on the back of of boat or walking like being in what i call the danger zone with the loop in their mouth because i've resuscitated three people who had the three loop people, in their mouth wow. in a danger zone um uh and then passed out because they were distracted you know yeah. there's no reason you need to dive it like breathing it on land right you know mm-hmm. it's for underwater mm-hmm. so <laughs> so walk yeah. safely yeah I mean, I actually, yeah, the, that inter, that interchange in the water, right on the surface, is that's the danger. Yeah, very mm-hmm. dangerous spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my husband just sent me a note. Testing my new bike seat in the parking lot. He's waiting for me to go for a bike ride. <laughs> oh man, I bet, I bet. How's the weather over there? Uh, well, it's actually the sun popped out today, and it's about I think six or seven degrees. So um, nice. <laughs> it sounds. That t- sounds very cold, it's cold here. It's actually 20K winds, but we're going out on the bikes for sure. We need some exercise. <laughs> Every day we can. We're on our bicycles. We're so we're so lucky to live in this small town where we can, you know, slip out, go do a ride, and not interact with humanity. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so Rebecca, I'm sorry. I need to finish answering Rebecca's question. So you don't do a pre-breathe? Yeah, I do a pre-breathe. I do a pre-breathe in between, every, like, before every dive. So, but... I'll go off the loop to walk. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Back yeah, in my I mean, early youth, I also like was walking with a rebreather loop in my mouth and I tripped on a tree trunk and fell and cut the crap out of my face. So oh, wow. that's another, another reason why. <laughs> yeah. What makes it a danger zone according to you? Um, any place. So what makes it a danger zone? Any place you can fall in the water. Um, so if you're, if you're walking, you know, to the steps of Ginny, danger zone. If you're walking to the back of the boat, danger zone. Like if you're walking, like I was, <laughs> I was carrying a couple of side mount tanks on the concrete at at um, Little River one day when mm-hmm. the Crocs I was wearing just went, Wah! oh no, Me and the side mount tanks in the water in my dry suit undergarments. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a danger zone there. Uh, so any place where you could fall in the water and drown, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, I know the steps of Peacock. Um, yeah, know, a lot of people I've have fallen of, down those. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And you fall down those, you fall head first and whatnot. And so it's a very yeah. it's a terrible place to get hurt. There was a, there was a uh, famously uh, mean internet bully back in the day that used to um, – uh, go after everybody online. I won't even use his name because he doesn't doesn't deserve yeah. to be spoken. Anyway, um, uh, this this guy fell down the steps of Peacock one day in his in his doubles with his fins in his hand and his mask in his hand and his tanks off and uh, fell in the water and proceeded to suck in a lungful and then choke really badly. 
in front of one of these people that he had been harassing relentlessly for years. And the guy was teaching a, a class. And uh, as this person's flailing in the water, half drowning, his students go, should we help him? And the instructor says, That's okay there. not <laughs> yet. <laughs> not yet. I, I know that story. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it's a classic one, you know, it's a community. Mm -hmm. If you're out ragging on the community, you know. So Adam has another comment about mm -hmm. how the implement implementation of checklists reduced complications in surgery by at least 30%, death rates by 47%. Do you think this could apply to diving as well? Absolutely. And St Simon Mitchell wrote a great article uh, for a medical journal on mm -hmm. exactly that, how um, checklists and surgery um, improved the outcomes and how it It'll do the same for rebreathers for diving. Yeah. I think mm. the crazy thing was when they started implementing checklists into surgery in ORs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know. Was, Before that, they were like cutting 2000. off their own leg. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we yeah. left some things in there. Oops. Yeah. Oops. It was the right leg. Damn. <laughs> you know? oh. Yeah. Yeah. We joke about it, but it's happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Michael Menduno says hi. Good old Mike. Oh, cool. Hey, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, be for those that don't know Michael, Aquacore um, right. was absolutely the Bible for early tech diving. And uh, we all worshipped, <laughs> waited anxiously for every issue that came out of Aquacore. So uh, Michael was the publisher, editor, visionary. Yeah. Right. The visionary of it. So. Yeah. So if he's doing a, a talk with you guys, that, that'll be really, really interesting to get his whole historical perspective on, on the industry. Yeah. Oh yeah, super excited about it. So, mm -hmm. see, is there any tip, tips. Alex asks? Is there any tips for sanitizing the loops during many days at a remote location? Oh um, yeah, we, we sure. have Steramine with us. Yeah, that's what we use. yeah, that's the easiest thing because it's a dry tablet and it's lightweight, mm -hmm. easy enough to take, and then. Um, you know, whatever whatever your particular rebreather manufacturer recommends for your unit, just um, follow that that sanitizing cycle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Michael cool. said hi. Thank you, Jill. Aw. <laughs> I love Michael. <laughs> cool. Who else did we miss? I know there were some questions that went by that I didn't even uh, mm -hmm. uh, get to. Let's see. Stefan's got so many great comments here. And <laughs> Rebecca, too. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's... Right. Um, you know, here's an interesting topic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you back, at least back when I was kind of learning in technical diving, mm -hmm. it was like YouTube and like those kind of videos and those social media were so huge. Mm -hmm. I know you and people like Becky and people like Lamar from Dive Right were like, you get just a couple of videos were like gold. Oh, cool. And so, yeah, <laughs> we didn't now, have we didn't have the internet when I started rebreather talking. Exactly. <laughs> Barely. And it's, it's so different. Like, I mean, there were, when yeah. I was starting diving side mount, there was no, nothing on side mount. Mm -hmm. And then you and Brian came out with a book and it was a, it was a godsend. That was before mm -hmm. there were classes. And so. Yeah, they, I mean, the you internet's know, now, a double-edged sword though. Eh? Right? I mean, there's a and lot of great info. Wanna, yeah, yeah and there's a lot of great info. I'm, and a lot of crap. Um, <laughs> uh, Simon Mitchell has this great slide that he shows in his presentations, and it's a it's a doctor's poster. It's called the uh -huh. Bristol Stool Scale, right? So it's ten different pictures of different um, iterations of shit, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Loose and flocculent, well formed little pebbles, whatever, right? Right. So it's ten different types of shit with a number and a description beside each of them, right? And doctors use that in order to diagnose what might be wrong with somebody, right? Yeah. And so Simon always says that the internet is just like the Bristol stool scale, right? Like, mm -hmm. like the internet, like there's lots of stuff out there, but it's still all shit, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so you've just got to, um, like, there's good shit and there's bad shit, but it's still all shit. There's it's good internet, there's shit. bad internet, but you've got to use critical thinking and, you know, back up, um, you know, whatever you're reading to make sure that it's not someone's opinion that that is actually based on science and experience or yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly mm -hmm. it, it's um 
Yeah, it's it's like how the old forums used to be, and now kind of all the forums have kind of shifted over to Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's um, but and, I, like, and I admit I'm not on any forums right now. I uh-huh. just I just kind of have no use for it. But yeah, yeah. I I know I used to eat it up, and so mm-hmm. just like any kind of conversation on it, and but but like I think now you know like. I think social media has just played such a huge role in a sense of like, mm-hmm. like I see pictures now all the time of these, in, these incredible photos that back in the day, they were almost impossible to get. And now they're mm-hmm. just, it's just everywhere. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. Like what kind of, what kind of, how do you think that, you know, what kind of an impact would that have on like the community of like where it's so it's it, it appears that it's being more commonplace than it used to be. Oh, it's great that everybody's out there taking pictures, you know, with with whatever, um, mm-hmm. you know, GoPro or anything else. I mean, we get to see lots more examples of what people are are doing and and where they're doing it, and that's that's pretty that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The mm-hmm. the creativity is just kind of blown up on it in. It's um yeah, a lot different from those days when we were shooting film and you know had 36 frames to get right. <laughs> I could I yeah. cannot imagine cave taking mm-hmm. photographs with film in the caves and so and no I just I played yeah. a little bit with film, yeah. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it was hard. It, it's um yeah. I know it's you know and but now at least there's, you know, folks are diving with rebreathers and there, it gives you more time. And so, you know, oh, yeah. what a tool. Time and feedback. Yeah, it's good. Although just a, you know, a reminder to people that take a little time before you start using a camera and a rebreather. Um, the rebreather, um, it, it requires uh a lot of left brain analytical thinking, a good track of time. Like you need to, you know, you need to remember to check your displays often. Um, mm-hmm. The the camera, in order to be creative, is a right brain activity, and um, and that using your right brain makes you lose track of time and space. And combining those two activities can be really really dangerous. I mean, you know, both both Becky and I, when a when a project's complicated, and we we do everything we can to try and have a safety diver that's responsible for us as the camera person. Um, mm, that's so good. Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, because we've got our face in that, um, in that monitor in hundreds of pages of menus. And uh, our job is to be as creative as possible uh, without getting ourselves killed, obviously. Uh, but there are times when creative dis- distraction can, you know, take you away from monitoring your, your handsets or whatever else. And so a safety diver can be a great help both to ensure that you're not making mistakes, but also that you don't lose track of your navigation as well. Um, So if you don't have the benefit of a safety diver, just realize that 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 use of the creative side of your brain is taking you somewhere else that's not necessarily conducive with operating life support equipment. And uh, you have to be extra vigilant. Yeah. Yeah. Even, uh, Even a simple camera like a GoPro um, uh, yeah. if you're managing a GoPro and mm-hmm. it, unless it's like mounted to you and you're not touching it, mm-hmm. uh, it's like on a, a stick yeah. underwater or whatever. And you're, you know, managing that and say you have mm-hmm. a light, you know, there's a reason mm-hmm. why we don't use a lot of cameras with students either, you know? Oh yeah. We don't absolutely not. Yeah. Even though video feedback yeah. can be a huge help, you know, it still mm-hmm. can create more problems than it solves. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Well, cool. Um, you know, it, we're kind of we're we're getting all, we're getting along. Uh, mm-hmm. One thing that I wanted to mention about um, if you guys haven't read mm-hmm. Bill's book Into the Planet, I strongly recommend it. Um, the the stories are so good. You know, and, uh, <laughs> Jill, you did a great job of really kind of uh, telling your story on it. So thanks, thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it'd be some uh, good reading since everybody has reading time now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or yeah. if you don't want to read it, you can listen to it. There's an audio book version too. You can get it on uh, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. All perfect. over the world. Still yeah. Delivery. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All over. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the plug. Uh, those little things are important these days when we have no idea where the next income's going to 
<laughs> oh no, on? yeah. <laughs> and and you know you you have so many other books too. Like I, I yeah. anytime I find any kind of diving book, I try I eat it up. And so mm -hmm. if you're interested in cave diving, you know Jill, mm -hmm. you have your books on cave diving, and then you know you have this classic um, this articles and opinion. Uh, it's a, mm -hmm. this is a very interesting book because of how you have so many different authors and different yeah, topics. Yeah, I did that one quite a while ago. Yeah, I, I did yeah. that for the NSS CDS to help them raise money. So th I, I don't, I, I don't make any money from that at all. Um, but the NSS CDS still does. I just called all my friends and said, Hey, will you write an article on this? Will you write an article on that? And so it was just yeah. a collective, a, a, you know, opinions from many different thought leaders in the industry yeah yeah and yeah. you know it, it'd be so good to uh, get a revamp on that so we can you know yeah. Buzz you and see how they'd like yeah i'm i'm am working on some of my other books um doing new editions now that i have the time on my hands so i'm <laughs> working working pretty hard writing these days <laughs> right right yeah so. yeah Oh, funny. <laughs> Becky says, Jill, Dave says, stop touching your face. But, but I, but there's nobody what here with me. What are you me. talking about? What's Dave talking about? Yeah. <laughs> when I'm outside in the world, I'm like religiously not touching my face, but pretty uh, isolated here with my, my husband in our own little bacterial bubble. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We're trying to stay in our bacterial bubbles here. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Thanks, Dave, though. <laughs> well, great. Uh, well, um, well, so we're we're doing this. Uh, we have our next episode next week. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be doing this at the same time, Thursday, uh, one p.m. Eastern. Uh, it was so great having you, Jill. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll meet y'all back here again next Thursday. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah. Uh, next week we have Becky. Uh, oh, Becky's first stop. All right. Yeah, so awesome. you got to come in and yeah. ask her all these questions. And stuff. <laughs> I will. Cool, cool. Right now so, I'm going to for a bike ride sounds great well you have yeah. fun be safe wear your Thanks. helmet you know yeah yeah absolutely Start safe, stay right. safe. yeah and i hope everybody else listening is uh, safe and well and uh you know home with their families and making the best of this this time right yeah it's we'll all get situation. out on the other end i'll meet you in the pool on the other end while we all get back yeah we'll, we'll see you at the dive site when everything's <laughs> over right okay all righty thank you very much Jill. bye-bye all right yeah bye-bye